I should say good evening. It's almost evening. Um, it's been a long day, so I'm going to just jump right into it, and I, I won't keep you too long. Um, Jafari unknowingly gave me a gift. He said, there will be no conclusion. <laughs> this is not a conclusion. Um, instead, it's a series of observations, questions, and suggestions um, for continued discussion. So I hope you take it in that um, spirit. This is going to be my only allusion to popular culture, I promise, and it's not going to be about Molly Cyrus, a name that I never say, but it is going to be to Olivia Pope, but not really to Olivia Pope, but to Papa Pope, but not really to Papa Pope, but an allusion to a phrase that permeates many aspects of black life, and that is twice as good. That phrase spoken by black elders to their young about how to navigate a racist society with a modicum of success, you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Today's presentations demonstrate that truism in that our speakers have mastered the discourses and methods of traditional disciplines while also creating work within the context of Africana studies that of necessity reaches across disciplines and beyond national boundaries. Together, they initiate a new conversation and etch out new paradigms that in turn should transform, should transform the disciplines. Twice as good. The symposium organizers ask that I listen closely throughout the day for themes, concerns, threads, emerging directions from the talks that we've heard, as well as share some of my own thoughts and concerns about the future of the field and these two parts of what I'm going to do that I'm tasked with actually resonate very well. I mean, I was stunned by how many of the things that came up were things that I was trying to articulate in my comments, but that were actually articulated with much greater eloquence um, in the talks that came before. So I'm just going to go through and, and, and pull out some things that I think the speakers have left us with um, and, 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 you know, in some ways left us with a kind of an, an agenda to pursue um, before, I mean, after this, Professor El Hamil telling us about um, in the efforts of the Moroccan government to censor a song about a particular woman, he said, this is his phrase, he says that they attempted to silence memory. The attempt to silence memory um, is something I think that will, I, I will speak a little bit about again, but it's something that happens periodically as part of a backlash that we often experience as violent and as political, there's also maybe not um, as explicit as a censoring, actually censoring a song, but there is something about a silencing of memory. And I think that um, in some ways popular culture plays a role in this, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Professor Hancher's brilliant talk um, resonating across so many ways, giving us um, very broad historical truths that speak very clearly to the specific times in which we find ourselves, calling our attention across nation states, those kinds of formations, to the ways that national crises generate what he says, generate disaggregation, that the quest for political order and rule um, transforms, seeks to transform arbitrariness into sameness. Um, I think that what we take away from his talk is that he pushes us to think broadly about what constitutes Africana studies. What are the texts that should be informing us as we pursue our questions and include among them, I mean, Du Bois we expect, Hannah Arendt, some of us don't expect Hannah Arendt, and yet he shows us how significant Arendt might be to our work. Um, Imani Perry, who um, just gave so much <laughs> to, to work with, but I, a few things in particular. One, she encouraged us to think about work that might be dictated by market forces rather than by rigor. And I think that is a real challenge, especially to the, young, the younger scholars and the graduate students in the, in the audience, that um, there's such pressure to produce a kind of work that is dictated by market forces, even though you don't necessarily see it in that way. What's popular? What's going to get you noted on a particular blog? What might get you a spot on a particular television show? What get, get you reviewed in a certain kind of way? Rather than rigor, and, and, and to this I would add, a rigor that means that we don't just write for the moment, but we also write for the long haul, that we write for um, a future future, 
that, you know, I was on a panel recently where we were talking about can text be transformative, can they be revolutionary, and having to remind ourselves that they aren't always revolutionary in the moment that they're produced, right? That they make really important interventions, sometimes in moments long after the moment of their production. Um, also, Professor Perry re reminding us um, to not um, expand, I'm sorry, let me get this right, yeah, to expand um, and embark on ways of creating new ways of talking, right, that that's part of what we have to do, create new ways of talking. And she ended on a very special note about um, the ways that politics don't have to dictate the conclusions that we draw, but they should help to shape the nature of the questions we ask, right? So we don't have to produce didactic work, but that the questions that we ask are always shaped by politics. And finally, she says, let's reimagine academia as a collaborative project rather than a competitive sport. Um, that certainly can be a contribution of um, Africana studies. I think it has been and can be one that we should think about in the future. She talked about the necessity of new vocabularies, about rethinking vocabularies that we have already inherited. Um, Etta Fields telling us from the position of the person trained as a historian and also as an Africanist about the necessity of ongoing interdisciplinary approaches um, that sometimes our subjects require or our questions require that we get our tools from other places, right? That the limits, and again, this is something that Professor Perry talked about, the limits of disciplinarity, right? That it force us to think differently, to move outside of the fields in which we are trained. Tracy Hux left us with that extraordinary image of Manning Marable with the pipe, um, whose wife is sitting in the back as his amen corner. Um, but I think also it's just the reminder, she talked about him, and this wasn't so long ago, as the one faculty member anchoring a whole program, right? One faculty member, and think about that generation um, of people who did that in very isolated places and how far we've come um, from that. So that, that's an image, I think, that should be part of our imaginary as we talk about our field. Um, and then the question and answer session from that section was also very interesting. I think this came from Professor Hanchard, who, and, and, and Tracy Hux also saying that we should be concerned about questions of environmental studies and ecology, that this should be part of the purview of Africana studies wherever we find ourselves. And Professor Hanchard putting that very provocative um, question about food politics in Africana studies. Is there a place to talk about, or there should be a place to talk about food um, politics? The words process and work in progress kept coming up too, that we are engaged in a process, that this project that we are part of is a work in progress. Um, Valerie Smith, I think, resonating with something that Imani said earlier is that um, how we have to move beyond certain guiding structures as primary. In Valerie Smith's case, she talked about the challenge of talking about home ownership is something to which people aspire, right? That there might be something else, that home ownership is not primary. Um, it was the same kind of um, resonated with what Imani Perry talked about, not always looking at kind of the individual versus the state, but how collective units challenge the state as well, right? That, that we move beyond guiding assumptions. Um, Harvey Young providing us with a compelling and very convincing, I think, argument for including performance studies in our analysis, um, how performance studies approaches allow us to engage with history, right? The ways that um, just the, 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 the questions, the, the paradigms that come out of performance studies can actually inform us as we move forward in this discipline, in our, in our field, not necessarily a discipline, even though it's interdisciplinary, that's still very historically based, how we can bring the insights of performance studies into that. Um, and I also think this came up in a couple of talks uh, that um, actually maybe two or three, maybe three, three talks for me was the issue of, of genre, Right, moving beyond the individual monograph, 
to the edited volume or the anthology, um, Judith Byfield's anthology on Africa in World War II, Val Smith's Race in Real Estate. Um, the, you know, the anthology, and I think Jafari talked about a kind of edited volume that perhaps, you know, not in addition to interdisciplinarity in terms of how do we get to these larger, broader questions about um, Africana studies, that it's, it, again, it's a collaborative project that the individual monographs are important, but that some of these are best tackled in a different form, right? Um, whether it be a kind of um, book that's an anthology or an edited project or a website bringing in digital humanities, that it's a collective project that takes work um, on many different fronts. Um, finally, well, not finally, there's more. Um, yeah, <laughs> Sherman Jackson talking about um, the parameters, being aware of the parameters um, that a study, uh, the certain kinds of study allow, right? That there are certain limits, again, this is Imani's point, limits that the disciplines have. There are certain things that you can't study within the context of certain disciplinary formations. And it's usually, interestingly enough, those are things having to do with things that are of importance to black people. <laughs> I wonder why that push you that have to push you outside of those disciplinary formations. And then he gave this really, um, I think, sort of. I, I, I can say it's a kind of intellectual longing, a longing. He said, a need for safe spaces in which we can come together in order to learn from each other, in places he says where we can be both vulnerable and charitable. And I just thought that. I know this isn't a word we're supposed to use, but I thought that was beautiful. Right, the idea of Africana studies as a place where we can be vulnerable, where we can be charitable also in our responses to each other, a need for safe spaces where we can do that kind of work. And then finally, the final um, panel uh, gave us a, a number of things to move forward with. Um, one, uh, through Jafari's talk, to take seriously and include the insights of black queer studies at the very foundation of what we do, to read um, what is already there. This wasn't even a call for creating something new, but to take, you know, take seriously the work that has already been done that has much to expand what it is we claim we're trying to do. He reminded us of the radical promise of black queer work and radical black feminism that always brought together art, scholarship, and activism, that these aren't things that are separate there. We, um, Deborah Willis, uh, not only talking about the ways that using images, talking critically about images, bringing them into our understanding, um, helps shape our sense of our experience and of our history, but I think a kind of thread in her talk also, which was I think the only place I heard it, was reminding us of the power and importance of pedagogy. Right? Um, when she shared what people teach and how they teach it and what goes into the construction of syllabi. And finally, Kali's talk, which talked about um, the ways that we continue to police and contain discourse, the ways that we continue to perpetuate silences, and I think this resonates with Jafari's, um, calling attention to what do we leave out still. And I think that might even be a good part of our process that we always ask ourselves. We can't do it all, right? No one conference can do it all and can satisfy everyone. But that at the end of everything, maybe the question we should have instead of a keynote is, okay, what did we leave out, right? What do, and, and why? And what are the values for the reasons why we, that, that, that inform the reasons why we left it out? And do we need to do something about that? What do we leave out still? Um, and the, okay, Kali also said something, and this is, this is probably maybe just resonates with me, and I'll come out like that. It's probably just about the way I'm thinking right now, but it might have something to do with all of you. I think it's because I'm in Philadelphia, because I'm thinking about family. Um, I'm thinking about three generations of women in my family, and she's asked this question. Um, what kind of skill set um, might a black woman have to have or need in order to survive? Think about that. What kind of skill set? And that, and and she would because she was talking about it in the context of black women engaging in violence. I'll tell you, I was thinking about a paternal great aunt, a maternal aunt, and a recently departed niece who liked to fight. That's what we used to say. They liked to fight. They didn't like to fight, but they they knew how to fight. Right? They, <laughs> they had a skill set that was valued. I valued it because I don't have that skill set. Right? <laughs> 
But I want to, this is a way at getting at the lives of, um, you know, I think often getting at the lives of people who are often fall between the cracks, right? That, and not only saying, acknowledging that they have the skill set, but why do they? Why did they need to acquire it? And why is it necessary for their survival? And finally, Jafari left us with this wonderfully expansive notion that rather than policing the boundaries of blackness, we engage in a blackness that recruits. And I think that could be a motto for Africana studies. So that's, those are the things that I heard. And then this is um, some things that I want to share. And I think they come together in interesting ways. So first of all, um, this is a season of commemoration and celebration. We have commemorated the 50th anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, the March on Washington, as well as the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. In our field, it is a season of celebration. The Departmentalization of Africana Studies here at the University of Pennsylvania. Yesterday, colleagues at Temple celebrated the 25th anniversary of the PhD in African American Studies, the first such program in the nation. At the end of this month, we at Columbia will celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Institute of Research in African American Studies. In this instance, our celebrations are also commemorations in that they honor the memory of long struggles, the memory of many thousands gone. And all instances of commemoration and celebration call upon us to reflect back and to look forward as well as to evaluate where we are. They are moments of evaluation and of myth-making, moments where we struggle over the meaning of those instances we commemorate as well as wrestle over next steps. I want to call our attention to the context in which our celebrations occur, the context in which our commemorations occur. This makes sense because our institutional programs are one outgrowth of the difficult struggles that we commemorated this year and that we always commemorate. They were certainly not the only products, nor were they necessarily its intended ones, but there is a relationship between that struggle and our institutional formations. Black studies, African American studies, Africana studies, African diaspora studies, this is a three-fold project, one that is intellectual, political, and institutional. Three distinct but related elements that have three distinct, if related, histories. Our celebrations recognize one aspect of the Black Studies Project, its institutionalization. Better still, I would say, um, particularly the ones that I mentioned, the, the departmentalization here, um, the founding of, of African American Studies at Columbia, the PhD program at Temple, that these recognize not just the institutionalization of our field, but the institutionalization of it within predominantly white institutions of higher learning, right? And how narrow our history would be if that was the only point that we commemorate, right? For a true institutional history would start with the early literary societies of the 19th century, or maybe with the include the American Negro Academy founded in 1897, or the Schomburg Collection of 1925, or the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915. History has taught us all of these extra academic institutional formations. History has taught us that many of these early efforts to institutionalize the study of black life were born in the midst of one of the most challenging periods of our history, the period most often in the United States known as the nadir because of the vicious backlash against the progress of reconstruction that's now a period spoken of by literary scholars as post-bellum pre-Harlem, a way of to signal the period's tremendous political and cultural energy as well. While it was a period of retrenchment, it also witnessed the founding of major black organizations and also gave birth to an unprecedented amount of writing in all genres. There is an indeed a relationship between the oppressive nature of that time and this outpouring of organizational and creative energy, which in many ways is a response to the retrenchment. The institutionalization of Africana studies at a predominantly white universities came about because of the struggles of the black power movement. We know, of course, that the anti-colonial, anti-racist, intellectual formation, and political movements which set the foundation for Africana studies precede its, the moment of its institutionalization. So I think one question that we might ask is what is the relationship between our present 
institutional moment and the social, political, and cultural context in which we find ourselves. For instance, the previously mentioned commemorations and celebrations all occur at a moment when ordinary people of all races and throughout the globe find themselves between a rock and a hard place of neoliberal reforms, drastic austerity measures, and ever-increasing disparities of wealth. Not to weigh, not, and that's just not even mentioning the way that neoliberalism is shaping and reshaping the institutions in which we find ourselves. In, U- in the United States, this occurs at a time that we have the ascendancy of a black political and media elite that in many instances has become the face of this agenda, while at the same time, or perhaps necessarily, and I think they're related, necessarily chastising the black poor, which is what um, Kali mentioned. It occurs at a time when popular culture narratives rewrite African-American history as a triumphalist narrative that leads directly to the nation, the election of the nation's first black president, while at best marginalizing the more radical elements of our struggle or at worst demonizing or actually lying about them. Here I'm thinking of a popular film like The Butler, which I enjoyed and I cried, so don't, I did. But I'm thinking about a film like The Butler and um, also about our president's remarks over and over, but most egregiously at the commemoration of the March on Washington, um, worth repeating here, I think, right? Following a recitation of of the noble struggles of the civil rights movement, bear with me, it's a long quote, um, President Obama said the following. And then, if we are honest with ourselves, we'll admit that during the course of 50 years, there were times when some of us, claiming to push for change, lost our way. The anguish of assassination set off self-defeating riots. Legitimate grievances against police brutality tipped into excuse-making for criminal behavior. Racial politics could cut both ways as the transformative message of unity and brotherhood was drowned out by a language of recrimination. And what had once been a call for equality of opportunity, the chance for all Americans to work hard and get ahead, was too often framed as a mere desire for government support, as if we had no agency in our own liberation, as if poverty was an excuse for not raising your child and the bigotry of others was reason to give up on yourself. All of that history is how progress stalled. That is how hope was diverted. It is how our country remained divided. I still can't get through it sometimes. So black people's excuse making and criminality is why progress was stalled, how hope was diverted, how our country remained divided. Never mind Cointel Pro, never mind deindustrialization, <laughs> never mind the rise of Reagan Republicans, never mind the exploitation of racist anger, never mind police brutality, never mind redlining, never mind defunded public schools. Um, this is a period when I grew up, was Philadelphia. It was a regime of Frank Rizzo. Never mind Frank Rizzo, right? (laughs) That paragraph alone gives us enough work for the next generation of Africana (laughs) studies, right? Mm -hmm. But I digress because I could spend most of my time on that paragraph and all the other egregious statements leading up to this one. My point is what work does this statement do in this moment? At this moment of commemoration, why rewrite and falsify? And it is a false. Falsify our history in that way. Now, others far more eloquent than I have taken this on, but it does provide a sense of the broader discourses that either have not been informed by the conversations that we have, like the one we had today, or, and I think this is the case, purposely ignore or defy them. This version of history is not only pitched at a white audience who applaud this kind of critique as honest and forthright, but I think it also helps to consolidate a black elite who call it black love, I mean tough love. Is there a relationship between our deeper entrenchment in the academy and the broader political and cultural moment. And I'm not here in any way suggesting some simplistic notion like intellectuals have abandoned the struggle and hidden themselves in the ivory tower. In fact, I think the absence of insight produced within the context of African-American studies in these false representations of our past is what is so striking. Not only 
um, just because the absence of the work we've done um, in the portraits painted by our president or a popular film director, because I think that both of these are purposeful and ideological, that they, they choose not to include the work that has been done over the last 20 years. Not that they're not aware of them, of it. But I'm concerned about the absence um, of a kind of the, the influence of the work that we've done um, in the response to um, the, pub the public response, the media response, the response of the critical establishment to things like the film or like the speech. Um, that that absence, that that seems to be, continue to be uninformed by the work that we've done. That the butler could have such a simplistic portrayal of the Panthers after a decade of work loosely called the New Black Power Studies or work like my colleague Alondra Nelson's brilliant Body and Soul, The Black Panther Party, and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination, actually is not surprising that the butler would have that. But that filmgoers and reviewers would fail to take note of this distortion of history is something else and ultimately more dangerous. Um, that it can be swallowed wholeheartedly as an unproblem representation of our past is a problem. And this is even more so um, when that representation is put forth by our president. Now, of course, we know that he does so in a context of vitriolic and violent backlash against his ascendancy, and we must remain ever vigilant about that. But I think it is quite telling that while black peoples and the broader society can entertain a critique of the racism that informs both the organized and the just absolute insane um, backlash against him, that both black people and the broader society are less likely to welcome or engage critiques of his chastising of black people and the black poor. That if we're back to the notion of censorship, right? We censor those critiques or the ways that those representations of our past are a form of censorship too, silencing memory back to that first talk. Um, certain dehistoricized narratives of black life fit quite well into a story of story that America wants to tell about itself, to itself, and to the world. But as the philosopher Richard Rorty notes, the struggle for a nation's, and I would say a people's identity and soul, is a struggle over the ways stories, symbols, and narratives of the past are created and told. Perhaps one cause of achieving a black presidency has been the sacrifice of a more complicated critical version of that narrative. There are a few ways of addressing this, and I will suggest only one that I think is very doable for us at, a, at this moment. So this is one thought about a future direction um, of our programs. I would like to see us, now that we have the institutional space, <laughs> help to facilitate forums for discussing how best to make information, particularly the work we do, inform a broader conversation, not necessarily through the corporate media. I don't think that's the place to do it, and I don't think that it's really possible, nor by becoming journalists and media pundits. That's fine. Some of us are very good at it. Most of us are not. Most academics can't talk to themselves, let alone to anybody else. But we're really smart, and we can maybe talk to each other. So um, not becoming journalists or media pundits, though some of us do this quite well, but that as institutional units, not as individual scholars, we find ways to create dialogue with others, members of the general public, but also with serious working investigative journalists, the kind who read, who write informed essays, articles, blogs, that we talk with school teachers and community organizers and not talk to them. I'm seriously serious about with them so that they're also helping to inform the work that we do and this kind of research agendas that we set up. One model for this is a kind of working group. My model has been um, a group that I was a part of called the Jazz Studies Group, and there are people here who are part of the Jazz Study Group too, that was um, at Columbia, which transformed my thinking over a decade ago. Um, in that group, scholars and critics from a variety of disciplines met regularly with musicians, graduate students, visual artists, journalists, arts, um, the administrators of arts institutions, we all read the same text, we heard the same talks, we had conversations with each other about subjects, but also about language, about framing, about politics and process. 
Um, and it was a process of reciprocity. And the results can be seen in a number of books, exhibits, albums, productions, articles, essays, reviews, and documentaries. And many of these were collaborative projects. And I think that we can house those kinds of projects around a number of different issues. And I'll just talk about a few of them. I can imagine the projects that look at the way specific local communities of everyday people in the present time and over time have encountered, struggled against, resisted, or defeated by the current state of states of inequity and by various forms of neoliberal reform. Reading my colleague Stephen Gregory's prize-winning work on the Dominican Republic, The Devil in the Mirror, has made me think of possible conversations, working groups between anthropologists, historians, documentary filmmakers, doing work on local communities throughout the diaspora, noting similarities and differences while grounding themselves in a specific, if shared, history. Similar projects might form among scholars, journalists, and artists organized around popular culture or dance, an especially exciting and emergent arena of study. Um, so that if you have to say something about Molly Cyrus is twerking, I don't know why, but if you have to, um, it can come out of this kind of informed conversation. Um, uh, there are a number of other ones. Um, these are um, institutional projects. In addition to nurturing our individual research, our institutions, departments, centers could house, could incubate, could fund these kinds of collaborative discussions, dialogues, working groups, um, and projects that are less about the production. Here's another way of using that working group format, less about the production of new work as it is about taking the time to read works that we haven't had time to read because we have so much else that we have to do, right? So taking the time to read maybe some of the work on black sexuality studies or black queer studies um, or critical ge geographies or any number of things to, to, to see what they have to say, to see what questions animate their investigations. Um, a kind of old-fashioned reading group, <laughs> even, um, that includes not just us, but all of these other actors um, that will let us rethink what we teach, how we organize, what we think about, and what we write. So that's an institutional project. And now I want to turn to an intellectual one. I want to talk about the work of individual scholars that has changed my own thinking in the past few years, and I think that in some ways models the kind of interdisciplinary work that we have been talking about. And it just so happens, I, I knew one of them was going to be here. I did not know the other one was going to be here. But um, So anyway, it just so happens that you know the people who are here are the people who are changing my life in some ways. Um, so I want to talk about the three recent books, I think, that... Um, that um, certainly have, has transformed the way that I think, and I think that model some of the kinds of work that we might be doing. Um, I've talked about these in previous talks as well, um, so it's not something that I'm just doing because they're here. Anyway, work that makes us think some central paradigms in our field. One, um, as some of you know, my earliest work was on migration, and lately I've been forced to rethink the meaning of migration and mobility in black life, and replacing it, instead of just a kind of dominance of migration and mobility, replacing it with a consideration of the relationship between migration and confinement. My earliest work on the centrality of migration to African American life has been challenged in ways um, that, since I've discovered a way of talking about one element of migration that was always there, but for which I did not always have a critical vocabulary. And that's this, that while movement and mobility is ongoing and continuous, so is confinement in the form of residential segregation, urban renewal, incarceration, surveillance. Times change, places change, but bodies and bodies continue to move across time and space, but mobility doesn't have a teleological relationship to freedom. Um, for from my vantage point as a literary scholar, I'll go back to canonical texts that even tell us this. In Native Son, Bigger is the quintessential fugitive, right? His fugitivity, though, leads to ever-narrowing spaces on the south, south, of, south, south side of Chicago, or um, Invisible Man, who ends up in that confining space of his brightly lit hole, or Ludi in the street, who's constantly walking Harlem but getting nowhere. The final image of her on a train leaving Harlem, only to go to Chicago, where challenges to her mobility will continue. So yes, movement 
now is giving way to newer, more complex, more sophisticated forms of confinement, mobility bringing on greater surveillance. Bigger's movement make him the objects of surveillance. So too with Richard Wright himself. As he moves from the U.S. to Paris and through Africa, Europe, and Asia, the more he moves, the more he is under surveillance. In fact, in many instances, mobility brings about the surveillance of the state, right? I'm, this is true of Pearl Primus, who I, who I recently wrote about. I'm grateful to my colleague, the art historian, Kelly Jones, who turned my attention to Harvey Young's, I don't know where he is, but turned my attention to Harvey Young's um, embodying the black experience, stillness, critical memory, and the black body. Young brilliantly elaborates upon um, this notion of mobility and confinement to talk about stillness. He calls upon us to, quote, revisit conceptualizations of the black diaspora as pure movement. For Young, quote, it is possible to locate the experience of the black Atlantic where stillness is an integral part of the Atlantic crossings, that bodies cross in a ship, but they cross being contained in the whole of that ship. Consideration of the bodies that moved across the Atlantic did so as confined bodies, chained, immobile, quote, he says, rendered immobile even as they moved across the ocean rendered immobile even as they moved across the ocean. He writes, quote, the captives confined within holding cells spent more time waiting to travel the Atlantic than it took them to sail across the ocean, right? They spent as much time in the holding cells. Um, I do not cite Young to suggest that we jettison our attention to movement for a focus on immobility, but instead I think his formulations encourage us to think about those moments where mobility embodies immobility, or better yet, still for my purposes, when mobility results in further confinement, when the two contradictory impulses are contained with each other. Given my own interest in 20th century migration, confinement within mobility is represented in a number of ways, including places like the Jim Crow train, or the makeshift boat that fails to deliver desperate immigrants from the shores of North Africa to places just off the coast of Sicily. Unlike recent efforts to critique and jettison the focus on agency, which mobilized much of our scholarship in the 1990s, the turn to the mobility confinement dialectic acknowledges agency while also making note of the efforts to thwart it. It is this back and forth which characterizes so much of the experience of persons of African descent that every moment of seeming progress is met with a moment of backlash, a brutal backlash. Second, in two very different books, Sister Barbara and Karen Fields and the critic Imani Perry both encourage us to stop conflating race with racism, to understand the distinction of the, and the relationship between the two, and to focus our attention on the eradication of the latter, which will surely weaken the former. Furthermore, both books make the effort to provide us with a critical vocabulary and conceptual tools in order to enable the work they suggest we do to move closer to something that might be called a post-racial society, although neither claims that as a goal. For them, the eradication of inequality and injustice supplants it. In More Beautiful and More Terrible, The Embrace and Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States, Imani Perry argues that the post-racial discourse reflects, quote, both an anxiety and confusion about what race means and doesn't mean now. She warns that, quote, the mid-20th century framework for understanding race and racism handicaps our comprehension and action in the 21st century, end quote. Consequently, she sets out to provide a framework for comprehending contemporary incarnations of race and racism. She turns to what she calls the practice of racial inequality by focusing on specific practices of inequality, actions that individuals take that researchers can identify as being clear decisions to disadvantage, quote, others on the basis of race. In addition, she coins the phrase, quote, post-intent racism, end quote, as a more specific way of understanding practices of racial inequality that are prevalent today. Her call for us to, quote, look beyond intent and determinism as a signature element in the definition of racism does not insist that intentional racism and racial determinist ideas are gone from American consciousness, but instead to think of racism only in terms of racist intent creates a distinction between that which is racist and that which is acceptable, right? So if people don't intend to be racist, that's acceptable. <laughs> Today, many, if not most Americans, would identify intentional racism as wrong, but she notes, quote, our habits, our attitudes, our behaviors, our entertainment, and a plethora of choices we make that actually work to support racial inequality are in place. 
In Racecraft, The Soul of Inequality in American Life, the brilliant sisters sociologist Karen Fields and historian Barbara Fields distinguish between race, racism, and racecraft. Race is, quote, a conception that nature produced humankind in distinct groups, each defined by inborn traits that its members share and that differentiate them from members of other distinct groups of unequal rank. Racism, quote, is the theory and practice of applying a social or civic or legal double standard based on ancestry. And then to this, they add a third, race craft, the mental terrain and perversive, pervasive belief. Race craft, they say, originates in the imagination. Race craft is one among a many, many complex systems of belief with combined moral and cognitive content that presuppose an invisible spiritual quality underlying something that acts upon the material realm of beings and events. We can be more sure that witchcraft exists than we are that witches do. They say the same holes for racecraft and races. <laughs> Each of these works result from years of serious reading, studying, and conversations across a variety of disciplines. They are efforts that take time, the results of slow thought, not driven by professionalism, but by a serious concern with an intellectual problem or not. They attempt to make contributions to how we think about things we think we already know. They are works for the long haul. Together, they have shaken the very foundation of my own work, forced a rethinking of the terms that I took for granted, like migration or structural racism or mixed race. I think they point in a fruitful direction that we might follow to really do the work of forging new conceptual frameworks, new vocabularies, um, without throwing away the baby with the bathwater. It is my hope that with the institutionalization of African American studies, we may have a place, a site, where this kind of innovation and creativity is welcomed, encouraged, and nourished. So since there are no conclusions, <laughs> I want to be in conversation with every one of you. I don't ever want to frame a question or a project without conversing with you. I want to examine the values undergirding the work that we do together. I want to formulate a conception of myself, of the self, in relation to others engaged in a shared intellectual, institutional, and yes, political project. This symposium has modeled what I hope is the future of Africana studies as a space where we are made smarter and better by the conversations, the debates, and the dialogue we have, and by the actions that we will pursue together. Thank you. <laughs>